Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Instead of meditating on one of the three scripture lessons, I would like to turn our attention to the introit. Now, for those of you who may be wondering what exactly the introit is, it happens to be the psalm appointed for the day. And for those of you who have been attending our Sunday morning Bible study, which should be all of you, by the way, you will remember that the appointed psalm really is meant to capture the theme of all of the lessons, especially the Old Testament lesson and the Gospel lesson. And this week, the theme of the introit is this. God is king over all the earth. It's a good theme, too, because it succinctly captures the nature of God as he is described in our other lessons. For instance, the Old Testament reading for today is the account of God creating Adam, an act that only God himself could achieve. And the gospel lesson is Jesus feeding thousands of people with only a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Again, this is an act that only God by his almighty power could achieve. Truly, these events demonstrate that God is king over all the earth. But this morning, I want to especially focus on what it means that God is king over all the earth and how we are to respond when we come to realize this fact. I think it's important to begin with the reality that nowadays it probably doesn't feel like God is king over all the earth. Everywhere we look around the world, it seems as if the world has gone mad. It certainly isn't living the way that God wants it to. And it probably makes us wonder if God really is king over all the earth. I mean, wouldn't it make sense if God were reigning like this, that the world would be a little more attentive and mindful to God's reign? We don't even really need to look to the other side of the world and all its madness. We have plenty right in our own country. Our leaders are hardly a picture of fidelity and loyalty, even by human standards, let alone God's. Almost every day there is some other revelation that our public institutions are corrupt, filled with people who no longer do what is right, but what is merely expedient for their own desire. We have people being killed in our streets by those in authority. And in turn, we have angry citizens who are seeking to air their grievances by killing those whom God has put in authority. The pace of these sad events, too, it's not slowing down. There only appear to be more lies, more deceit, and more death ahead of us. And at the beginning and the ending of each day, we are faced with the reality of this awful truth of the world that we live in. I think it's hard for us Christians not to be discouraged. We don't want to live in the midst of such a, uh, such a corrupt society. Our desires are not to see peoples of differing views murder one another. We want to live quiet, peaceful lives in all godliness. But it seems that the world is determined to live otherwise. And it's going to try and bring us down with it. And so we may begin to wonder, where is our God who says that he is king over all the earth? And why does he seem to do nothing? If you find yourself thinking those kinds of things, and it's sort of understandable if you do, take heart. For what the Lord declares of himself in today's psalm is true, just as the psalmist says. The Lord, the Most High, is to be feared. A great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. The Lord is to be feared because he does, in fact, rule over the earth. And the nations are under his control. The thing of it is, our God is so great that he doesn't need to rule the world with the kind of power that the world counts as greatness. Our God is to be feared because he rules the world by things that are seemingly insignificant. 
which is why the world can't tell that he's ruling at all. Think about it this way. When God created Adam and Eve, he made them and thus all people to live in a world that was created and ordered by God. It is a world with rules, and those rules still exist. They are most easily apprehended in the Ten Commandments, but they are as much a part of the written word of God as they are the order of creation itself. And man can try to live outside of those rules that God has made. I mean, this is what happens when we see all the evil around us. But God's rule over the world will not be undone or set aside by the pithy efforts of those who mean to do evil. If God had said we are not to lie and murder, he means it. And by the power of his rule, there will be consequences for those things. See, we sinful people think that we know what is best for the world. It is why we lie and cheat and murder. And oftentimes, we really just don't think all that much about it. But creating a world in our sinful self-image will not bring us the kind of prosperous society that we think it will. On the contrary, our sinful actions will lead to our own ruin. And that is what is happening. Our society and its people are destroying themselves. And the more we try in our sinfulness to thwart the will of God by our own power and the corruption of our people and our institutions, the more the reign of God is going to be manifest to us. Because the rules he has set over creation and the order that he intends, it cannot be subverted. I probably don't need to point out the fact that the world has a hard time understanding the reign of God in creation by these simple things. It can't see that its usurpation of God's order and the resulting fall thereafter are in fact a demonstration of God's power in the world. I also think that we as Christians sometimes have a hard time remembering that too. It's why we can get discouraged. We forget that the will of God can be attacked by the world, but it can't ultimately be undone. The Lord will reign, which is why the psalmist repeatedly says, shout to God with loud songs of joy. Sing praises to God. Sing praises to our King. I'm pretty sure if I asked you if you feel like singing praises to God, given all the evil that is consuming our society, you'd probably look at me like there was something wrong with me. Who feels like praising God when the whole world is being turned upside down? There is a time for grieving and a time for lamentation. But we must remember as the children of God, our Lord has won the day. And not only has he won the day, he reigns over all creation from its beginning to its end. He is triumphant too, not only in creation, but also in terms of our salvation. And nothing, not even the devil himself or all his evil minions in the world can undo that fact. And yet the truth is that this can only be seen and understood by faith. Because God will not use the things of the world to rule and to reign. He will use the weak and the despised. If we understand this, we, like the psalmist, will sing praises to our God. Because the whole world is already under his feet. It's why our lives are ultimately defined by the hidden majesty of God on display in the crucifixion of his own son. It was there that our Lord demonstrated to the whole world that he is, in fact, reigning. And his will is ultimately done. There on that lonely hillside outside of Jerusalem, the Lord had himself put to death. To those standing by, it probably looked no different than any other execution of a common criminal. But to God, it was the working out of his power in the world. Because on that day, the Lord was fulfilling his promises. He was bringing the conflict between the sinful world 
and himself to an end. It was there that the futility of the world's sin and evil was finally conquered. For in the death of Jesus had come about the judgment of all sin. Our God went to war against the lies and the corruption of sinful hearts. And he did it by taking all that sin and all those evils upon himself. So that the wrath of God would not destroy the world and the lives of everyone in it. But rather so that God's wrath might destroy the only begotten Son of God. In this event, the sin of the world was taken away. That's how our Lord has fought against evil. And if he had chosen to fought against evil in any other kind of way apart from Christ, there would be no hope at all. Only the world's imminent destruction. But our God has fought, and he has won. And for the world, whether it knows it or not, there is hope. Hope in the forgiveness of sins that has come in Christ. Hope in the new life that sets us free from the ruling power of sin and the corruption of the flesh. We are no longer a people who must live our lives as those who are ruled by evil and sin. Because all evil and all sin was put to death in Christ, in his own flesh and his blood. Sometimes when this uh, comes up, you know, the fact that we are not ruled, that we are forgiven, question pragmatically arises. What does this really mean for us? How does it really change our lives? That's a good question. It's one that also has a good answer. Until this heaven and earth pass away, there will always be evil in our world. And there's always going to be sin in our lives. But we are not held captive to this evil as if it's a thing to be feared. We are a people who have been bought at the price of God's own life. And our sins have been taken away in the death of Jesus. We have been redeemed from all the evil that we see around us, that we see in our own lives. And we are not held captive to earthly fears in this life. We are held captive to the new life in Christ. I mean, really, when it gets down to it, that is the only real life that we have. It's why, as the world burns, the church may sing. Because our future is certain. And our lives here in this world are at peace with God. And the more the world rages, the more intensely do we come to know the joy of being set free from all this evil. So the next time our leaders fail us, which they will, or our institutions are shown to be corrupt, which they're going to be, or there is murder in our streets, we should give thanks to God that despite the darkness of sinful hearts, our Lord has loved us enough to die for us. So that even if we should die at the hands of a corrupt world, yet will we find ourselves living with God. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.